How are you, man? I'm Gil Roth, and you're listening to a bonus episode of my Virtual Memory Show podcast. This is a COVID check-in episode where I record with a past guest of the Virtual Memory Show to find out how they're holding up during the pandemic. As far as how I'm doing, um, my brain's pretty empty this morning, which I take as a good thing. Not in an ignorance is bliss kind of way or a burned out beyond recognition sort of thing, but just not flaring out in every direction at once, you know? Uh, if you're following my anxieties and insecurities through these daily podcasts, um, yesterday's board meeting with my board of trustees went fine. Um, in the morning, there had been some federal craziness I had to get involved in, uh, which I'm continuing to be involved in. Uh, but I really can't talk about that without editorializing in a way that's both uh, potentially damaging to my career and completely uh, opaque to most of you. So instead, let's get to today's guest. David Leopold is joining me from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. David runs the Ben Soloway studio, which honors the artistic legacy of his not so distant relative, who was this renowned painter, charcoal artist, and, and sculptor um, in the mid 20th century, really from the 30s on. Uh, the studio is this great space. I've seen a couple exhibitions there, and it's it's where I went to first record with David during one of the great podcast sessions I've ever had because of the bond he and I made, the particularly bad mental state I was in going into that session, uh, and everything else that was really... Um, well, David Saved This Podcast is a story I've told in the past, and I'll share it with any of you who want to hear it again at some point. Um, but anyway, I was awfully glad to get him on for this. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the day when I can just make another trip down there and, and to the farm where the studio and David and his family reside and just uh, just look at some art and take in the uh, the air. Now, as far as David goes, um, here's his Twitter bio, which helps explain most everything. Uh, father, husband, curator, author, archivist, gardener, music lover, twin, and cat housemate. Creative director, the Al Hirschfeld Foundation, which is how we first got connected because he had a book, The Al Hirschfeld Century, that he helped put together and write. Uh, as far as caveats go, not a lot. Also, one more thing. Near the end of the episode, uh, David talks about an exhibition he's working on with Michael Tisserand about the history of minstrel shows. And he just wants to make clear before you get to that part, uh, he, he did not mean it, any of it to sound uh, offensive or racist by any means. Um, Everything I know about David, I wouldn't, I didn't make that jump at all, but we're both a couple of white guys, so we both understand it's a sensitive subject. But um, please don't take the discussion of an exhibition about uh, minstrel shows to be in any way racist or derogatory towards black people and others who were um, portrayed in such shows. And now, here's me and David. How are you? How, how are you dealing? Uh, I, I am dealing very well. Uh, yeah. I'm surprised myself. Um, in the first, about a week before everything shut down, I got very scared. And and I'm not someone who gets scared or gets anxious. Uh, mm -hmm. So I felt this real like, oh, my God, this thing's coming. And so we went out and bought a month's supply worth of food and supplies. And my family thought I was a little bit of crazy. And... I just said, I'm going to feel a hundred percent better. And then everything closed down and right away they understood it. But for the first week, I, you know, I'm not someone who experiences anxiety much. And I felt this anxiety like this. I couldn't work. I, I just, it was like almost something in my chest. And mm. of course, uh, and that was compounded by, well, maybe I have it. Uh, yeah, of course. The hypochondria feeds everything else. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And but after about a week, I sort of took a breath and I realized, okay, this is what's happening. And I just got back to doing work because, uh, you know, like so many people you've interviewed uh, on these COVID check-ins, I'm used to working by myself. Uh, and most of my work, which is off in the future, is still going on. Uh, mm -hmm. If anything, I've had more work now because... Uh, I've been asked to do online exhibitions, and we yeah, just opened talk, one. 
I was going to say, can you talk about those a little? You just did the the first digital Hirschfeld uh, socially distant theater exhibition. Yeah. So. Yeah, we thought that was a good one to start with because it was the solo show as seen by Hirschfeld and we, you know, everybody's by themselves. So we'll, let's investigate that. Um, we have four planned uh, already pretty much done that we'll put up in six week intervals. Um, and then we're going to keep doing it until this somehow ameliorates till we can go back into real spaces. Um I'm probably going to, I'm working on uh, one for Soloway right now, Ben Soloway, the studio Ben Soloway, which I run uh, here in Bucks County. Um, and I've also offered my local art museum, the James A. Michener Art Museum, uh, uh, a really great regional institution that I've done work with over 30 years. And uh, I have everything. I have my, uh, all my labels and uh, panels and I usually have high res of all the images and I've offered to them that I would put together online exhibitions for that as well. So, um, and, and I'm also uh, consulting on an exhibition with the Arhuli foundation on uh Frontera music. Uh, this is Spanish language music. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was originally supposed to go to um sort of uh, smaller community centers and historical societies up and down California. Uh, um, and now the thought, uh, I, I started to talk to them about maybe we would do something uh, online because the idea that people are going to be back in public spaces anytime in the next, they had hoped to start in 2021. And I don't think that's going to be possible. Thanks for being realistic. I've had to talk down some guests already, as you yeah. may have heard, um, yeah. where they think, oh, yeah, by this fall, we should be able to know. No, maybe next fall, but more likely yeah. past all that. Do you have a background in Frontera music or is it more your your curation and general musical taste that drew you into that project? Um, well, actually, that was uh, uh, my uh, I have a twin brother in California. He's a county commissioner in Santa Cruz County, California, and he has been on their holy board for a while. And because he loves all of the things that Arahuli puts out because it puts out great music. And uh, I got a call one day saying, hey, your brother said you might be able to help us. And they had given me this. They told me this idea for an exhibition. And just because I've done a lot of exhibitions and a lot of exhibitions in non-traditional spaces, I started throwing out half dozen ideas of how they could do it. And then they came back to me and they said, could you put it together for us? And I said, no, because I don't know this material well enough. But what I can do is if you get the people together who know this material, I can help you craft it into an exhibition so that they know what they're working for. Because so often these things, you know, they're put together by academics who mm -hmm. want to put a book up on the wall. And that's not an exhibition. That's sure. a book on the wall. Mm -hmm. So it's more your your curation abilities, but also the fact that you've been involved on the music side of things that helps yeah. provide organizing uh, principle. Yeah. I got a reputation in 2015, uh, the Grateful Dead uh, archives called me at the very last minute uh, about putting together an exhibition for their 50th anniversary at the Field Museum in Chicago. They were doing these three final shows. And uh, like a fool, I said, yes, I would do it. And it was only six weeks before the event. And uh, it was actually just uh, uh, the most brazen tickets, uh, uh, you know, search that I, it was, it was the toughest ticket in America that year, that summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, all my regular sources had come up dry. And so I'd actually proposed this to the archives in January. And they called me in the first week of May for something that was going to be happening uh, on July 4th weekend. And I was opening a big show actually on Hirschfeld at the New York Historical Society. And they wanted me to go ra out right away. And I said, I can't. I have a week of uh, press to do. But then I flew out to the Field Museum and understanding, you know, the constraints, because that's one of the things you have to learn, uh, probably in anything, but certainly in exhibitions is, you know, know your limitations and then exploit those. And uh, one of the great things about doing an exhibition in which there's no time is no, there's nobody can say no. They just have to keep saying yes because they yeah. need it up. 
Uh, and I had, I, in my initial phone call with the field, I don't know what I had said, but they so bought into it that they gave me, I, I don't know if you've ever been to the museum. No. Uh, it's uh, the, you walk into the field museum, which is older than the natural history museum, but it's on par with that. Um, it's a great big hall, probably the size of uh, a train station. If you've ever been in 30th street station in Philadelphia, it's about that size. And sure. uh, uh, there are, there's a full size Tyrannosaurus Rex uh, skeleton, the most complete one. There's two uh, full size stuffed elephants. There are 40 foot uh, totem poles in there. And I had said this would be a great place to put a Grateful Dead exhibition. <laughs> and they bought it. And uh, we put together a show that turned out to be much, much better than anybody ever could have imagined. Um, and I only had about three weeks. Once I, I, I went there, I, uh, uh, I walked around the space and I knew we had no time. And I, I said to my contact uh, who had, uh, had left me, I said, leave me in the space. Let me think what I can do. And about 90 minutes later, she came, uh, she was passing through. And I said, I know what the show is going to be. Um, and I walked her through it. She looked at me. She's like, can you put that down on paper? I said, yeah, definitely. And that show was pretty much what I had envisioned uh, uh, on that first day. Uh, uh, we came back to, uh, I called the Grateful Dead Archive. I told them the kinds of things I wanted. I knew the story very well. And sure. uh, I I told them what I wanted and <laughs> they gave me everything. It was ridiculous. <laughs> uh, and the one thing they told me that I had to include were these uh, envelopes sent by deadheads um, for tickets for this and for other shows. They have the Grateful Dead started selling tickets to their own shows back in 1983. And uh, not they would never sell all the tickets to a show, uh, although this one was going to be that. But they would always have a portion of the tickets that they just sold. And so in order, those were always lottery type situations. So people would make the most attractive envelope they could think of because they hoped that whoever was pulling an envelope out of the pile would say that, <laughs> would looked, good. You yeah. know, that looked like a good one. <laughs> so I had a wonderful woman who ran the ticket office who was like a stone cold hippie, of course. And uh, she was very protective of the material. And... I had to figure out how these little envelopes were going to look in a space that was about the size of a football field and um and was like five stories tall. And I just thought these envelopes are going to disappear. So we made these plexiglass walls that you could put envelopes in so you could see the front and the back because everybody decorated the front and the back. And even though we had so much cool stuff, including a Jerry Garcia guitar, um, it was the envelopes that turned out to be the most uh, uh, interesting thing to people. And uh, then I got the reputation like, oh, performing arts exhibition that you need done really quickly. Call David Beopold. <laughs> <laughs> He's your crisis man. He desperately yeah. needs it. Yeah. <laughs> I did one for City Center last year and it was like, oh my God, uh, it was it was an insane project because they kept on changing what they wanted. And I kept, I must've done that show six times uh, before we actually put it up. Uh, Is there any aspect of, of the isolation and being stuck in the same space so long that's caused you to think about the exhibitions you do at, at the Soloway museum and ways of, oh, of well, so we were, reimagining we were, the space? Um, well, we, we don't, we have we're, the the exhibitions are presented right in Ben Soloway's studio, um, yeah. and so we don't have much opportunity to do much there. Although move around furniture and things like that, we have a what we call the second studio, which is the studio off the main studio that I use very much as a rotating exhibition space, and we move things around a lot in there. In fact, I was planning on doing a show on his handmade frames um, that we had to cancel and that we're going to not be able to do this year, and hopefully maybe next June we can do it. Um, Cause we, we typically put on a show in June and sometimes in October. And I just saw right away that this wasn't going to, we weren't going to be able to do that. Um, it hasn't changed my ideas about this place um, so much, but it, um, 
I, I'm just always figuring out what's a what's the best way to reach people. You know how to how when you do an exhibition, people most people think it's very easy. Put the pictures up on the wall, write a few words, and you're done. And you know if you do the job right, that's exactly what it feels like. Um, but there's the audience is changing. You know they want they won't sit and read labels in the same way. So how do you get them to interact with the work and and learn about it? So they so they leave there. You know my goal is in an exhibition is to not only sort of tell you a story but to leave you wanting more. You know because if you want more, you're going to be more engaged in the work. You're going to want to look at the catalog. You know um, I am really incredibly fortunate that I'm working on a show for next year on a regional painter whose name is Robert Beck. And he not only is a fascinating painter, but for 15 years, he's been writing um, about a thousand word essays on uh, art of all kinds, um, mostly having to do with his art and how he got that picture or um, the experience he had in painting it. And for a curator, it's gold. I mean, it's sure. absolutely gold. And he turns out he's a very fine writer. And, you know, I've come to realize he's probably the most articulate artist in the region, certainly now and maybe ever. So uh, I was very fortunate to raise the money for the show before everything went to seed. And uh, um, while I've been reading all these essays, I talked to Bob and I said, these are too good. We, we've got to do something like we've got to do more with this. People have to see these. So um, we called around to a couple of people who were interested in doing more. And we're going to come out with a book of the essays, um, which are always tied into a painting of his. Um, so we'll have a book of essays and we'll have a catalog for the show. And then we're going to have him read um uh, some of the pieces to create sort of a podcast that we can run during the whole run of the show. Hey, I mean, now the, you're muscling into my territory. Yeah, oh, sorry, yeah. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, I'm, I'm bringing the author. I, I always look at it is what in 50 years, if somebody wants to know about this artist, um, if I do my job right, they won't have to go too many places. Sure. Uh, and so with a living artist, you have that ability to sort of collect everything and present it all. And so uh, by the time I'm done with this exhibition, we'll have a very clear timeline on his paintings. Um, we'll have uh, all of his essays, well, not all of his essays published in a book, but some of the best ones. And the podcast will have him reading his own work. And I'm still toying with the idea of turning it also into a stage show of some sort. Um, a one person show would not be him. I would hire an actor to um, do more than dramatic readings uh, of uh, the pieces, but really sort of put them together so they tell some sort of story. Um, and uh, I already know the actor I want to work with. Um, I've read through the pieces, and uh, I think that I've put together a good hour of entertainment. Um, so that's exciting. I mean, I, I love doing things like this. And I mean, you also sound very much like you're focused on the post pandemic moment when we can actually be in person and, and, you know, gather in places like this. Right. Oh yeah. Uh, because you know, my main clients are museums and performing arts spaces and both of them are completely shut down. now. I mean, I could not imagine a world in which that happened. I mean, I couldn't imagine the world that we're in now. I mean, I don't right. think, uh, I don't read too much dystopian uh, fiction because I feel like it, it's like going to an amusement park. Why is that? I drive in New York. Why do I need to go to an amusement park? <laughs> yeah. I and, was talking with another guest about how I've, I've considered just driving into the city just because there's no one there. Right. Uh, no, no cars. And just, just to feel what it's like, which I know is, you know, exerting my privilege. But on the other hand, you sat in enough New York traffic. Yeah. You know, you, you sort of want to enjoy that just, just once. Just get out and, and zoom around the city with nobody else there. But but yeah. Well, you know, I always feel like you can do that at three in the morning or something like that. You, you know, uh, True. it isn't too hard. And I've also uh, – I've structured my life um, – 
that I don't go into this. I, I, I used to not go into the city until I wouldn't leave my home until about nine o'clock in the morning. So I couldn't do anything before 11 or 1130 in the city. And sure. I stayed late. I would usually see a show of some sort at the end of the day. So I missed all of rush hour. And it's actually very civilized if you don't have to deal with rush hour. Well, that was always my thing. And I, I've, I've told this one on the show. I don't, when I would go into the city for in-person shows, blah, 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 uh, I don't drive below 96th Street. I, I have a parking garage I'd use right next to the oh, West Side Highway on 96th. And so I'd just get the one, two, and three up the, sure. the, the hill from that at Broadway. That was it. I, I, I would, when I'd leave, I would literally just roll down a hill onto the West Side Highway and drive home. I'm missing that so goddamn much right now. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah, that, yeah. you know, going in and sitting down and recording with someone, stopping at the Super Taco truck right next to the, the subway, picking up a tongue burrito larger than my head <laughs> and trying to eat that while cruising up the West Side at, at 60 miles an hour. But, but it worked for me, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, uh, uh, the things that I'm missing um, are legion. Um, but then I also have a family here. And yeah. uh, my son's 18. He's a senior in high school. He's been robbed of his senior, you know, the last semester of his senior year. Uh, the, there would be no prom. There'll be no graduation. He had just submitted his Eagle Scout application, and uh, but he hasn't had his board review yet because uh, the local council doesn't want to do it um, via uh, video conferencing. They'd like to do it in person, thinking that it's going to end soon. Um, so it's, it's, he's really been cheated. And uh, fortunately, we had an Ecuadorian exchange student uh, here up until uh, a week ago and who was also 18. And I was uh, when when Henry first came to us and said he wanted to have this guy essentially move in with us. I was a little skeptical. We have a pretty good situation going with the three of us. But he was very uh, emphatic about it. And we decided, OK, why not? And it turned out. Uh, uh, this this kid, Jose, was l fantastic. It, it was like he was always a member of the family. And uh, so it, Henry had somebody to hang out with in the first three months of uh, this uh, pandemic. And so that was really, really great. We bought a basketball net so the two of them could play basketball. So, they didn't, you know, every time they went outside, it wasn't about yard work. Um, yeah. Strangely yeah. enough, they didn't want to do that all the time. <laughs> It's funny because you'd think child labor, et cetera, but yeah, yeah no, I, I get you. Yeah, how, how long did you go after that initial um, uh, hoarding, shopping burst? How long did you go without leaving the farm, the the, the grounds that you you you're on? I ha it was six weeks, <laughs> and uh, and then I've only been out one other time. Yeah. Uh, look, we're you want to talk about privilege? I live on a thirty four acre farm. I can walk a mile and not see anybody. Uh, we have uh, the fields. I mean, farmers are an essential uh, worker and uh, what they do is mostly solitary. So the fields are still being worked the way that they've always been worked. Um, the animals around me have zero idea of what's going on. The plants that are coming up out of the ground have zero idea. So if I don't have screens on, um, you know, when I'm outside, it's very normal. You know, there's there's no sign that anything crazy is going on. Um, and in fact, the traffic that I can hear from about a mile away is much less. So in some ways, it's idyllic. Um, my problem is I'm a people person uh, and I like being around people. It's the reason I'm doing this. You yeah, know, no, it's, it's it's good to have those conversations, even if it's, you know, at a remove like this. Well, and definitely, and and I have to say, I'm not trying to flatter you, but the the podcasts have been really terrific because they do give an insight into um, the creative world, the sort of philosophical world that you simply do not get in almost any other place uh, uh, about how people are dealing with this situation. It's been tremendously helpful to me. Thanks, man. That's, you know... For me, it's good just to have conversation, like I said, but to, you know, to hear from listeners every so often that they actually get something from this has been, uh, been helpful. The times I've, I've started to get down on every damn thing. So, yeah. Oh yeah. 
Oh, it's easy. Yep. It's easy to get in a pessimistic place. Yeah. Um, and sometimes yeah. you just wake up in the morning and it's the, the, the weight of it is just on top of you. And it's, it's, uh, it's tough pulling yourself out of that sometimes. Yo, de- oh, without a doubt. Um, so I try to deal with hand, it. Had, oh, go on. Yeah. No, I, I just try to deal with it by keeping a routine. Yeah. You know, I just do my thing. And, uh, I mean, part of me is happy. I don't have to go anywhere. Uh, you know, I don't have to worry about anybody coming by unexpectedly because my friends, they don't call it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I actually have a, I have a call scheduled with an old college pal tomorrow. Hey, he's a a longtime friend of mine, but we just haven't talked for, well, we would correspond when he lived in New York, we'd get together. He's up in Vermont now. And Mm -hmm. I zapped him a couple days ago and I just said, you know, if if you just want to call and vent or just shoot the breeze, that's cool. He's like, that would be really good. I said Saturday is going to be rough. I'm doing four podcasts. Wow. Sunday, anytime. Let's let's. So you know the idea that we have to schedule that sort of thing. Eh, that's a little bit of my micromanaging control freak. But on the other hand, <laughs> it'll be nice to to talk. You know, and just in a different context than these. But to just catch up with people that you know, n- nobody drops by. There is none of that anymore. Right. You're right. So, oh right. I mean, it's it's. Uh, and, and, and I have people, uh, had a woman call me the other night, uh, who, I mean, just obviously needed to talk. She was on the phone for an hour. I mean, I tried mm-hmm. to get off several times, <laughs> yeah. but it was I've obvious. Had, I've had some of those, uh, if you've listened to these, all these episodes, there are some of those. There, yeah, there are yeah. ones where I'm like, this person really needs to talk right now. <laughs> so let's, <laughs> let's just keep the episode going for a while. The afterwards where we're waiting for their episode to upload. Some of those yeah. have stretched on longer than the conversation itself, just because <laughs> they, they like talking to someone they haven't spoken to, you know, for the last two months straight. So. Sure. Um, the other thing that I have found fascinating about this is I participate in a lot of conference calls. You know, you work with a team on an exhibition and conference calls are part of your life. What is amazing to me now, the same people I used to have those calls with all the time, just on the phone, they all want to do video conferencing. And, you know, I I, I mean, (laughs) I I came to understand that they just need to see somebody else, but really I don't need to see them. You know, (laughs) I I, I love them all. They're all nice, but really. If any of us look good on screen, this isn't the job we'd be doing. That's yeah. that's basically how I, I summed up. I've had one one conference call where they insist we're on Zoom, and I was just calling in. They're like, no, no, you have to do the video too. I'm like, you guys are going to get it. You know, you're going to understand. Gil is sitting around in a ratty cardigan every day, and he's got the the, the crazy homeless guy hair. But screw it, if you if you insist, here you go. Uh, everybody else, it's just yeah. We're doing Zoom, but you can just call in. It's it's okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a little weird. But now, are and there particular? Oh, oh, uh, just are there particular types of art that lend themselves to like the the, the digital milieu versus the the physical? Are there ones that you could not translate into the the digital form? I think of the Soloway sculptures and things like that, and how difficult it would be to frame those and represent those. But what's your experience like with Various well, genres and modes. First of all, seeing any art of any kind in reproduction is essentially to read the clip notes of it. Um, sure. And you just don't get the sense of what it's like. So that being said, um, so I think any flat piece of work photographed properly, you can put in there. Um, 3D pieces are a lot harder. Um and I think you would almost require a sort of 360 degree, you know, one of those cameras that show you the whole thing, almost oh, yeah. like a virtual yeah. reality experience. And and it's um, even before this pandemic started, there was a real issue uh, within the museum world about the fact that people no longer are, you know, they they wanted a different type of experience. They don't just want to see pictures on the wall. They don't just want to see sculptures on a stand. They want something else. And so I was already fearful that we were going into the world of sort of virtual reality and whatnot. Um, And I think this will just accelerate it. You know, uh, like so many things, this is going to accelerate that move to um, uh, disconnect. You know, that your experience is uh, is mediated by something else that you don't have anything to hold on to. You know, when I think of books and records as just electronic form, 
um, that you don't have any, I mean, my son has, I mean, he recently got into vinyl, but up until that time, he had never held an album, had never looked at like all the credits on the album. And, you know, for anybody of our age, um, yeah. that was a big part of life. You know, you, you, you scan those Not things. Him. Yeah. I mean, yeah. for who, who got the special thanks? <laughs> you know? And there's just the, the dimensions of album art. Now, the, the, the knock I've had over the years is all these kids getting into vinyl and all that stuff is all going to end when they finally, like, move and go to another <laughs> another apartment and realize, God damn, this shit is heavy. You know, and they're, they're carrying crate after crate of, of records around. That's when they'll start flooding back into the, the record stores. And uh, so how much can I get in credit for this? You know, But uh, that's just me being, uh, you know, uh, sneering at, at youth today, only because we went through all this, even with CDs, which were a lot lighter. But right, yeah, right. You know, so, enjoy. I mean, I, I, I'm, my concern is that this will put us further in our pods, as it were. Um, where we don't need the, you know, the interaction with other people. You know, for me, live performance has been so important because I want to sit in a room with other people. Um, and that live performance is in, really contingent on me being there. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, a good audience, uh, you know, you could do the same play every night. And uh, I've been a house manager of a theater. When you have a bad audience, the show is just not as good. You know, when you have a non-responsive audience, but when you have a responsive audience, it can be an incredible show. And I, that's what I love about it. Yeah, well, it's like watching these late night hosts doing their shows, yeah. you know, in their apartment on, on camera. It, when you don't get that audience reaction and they're pausing for where they assume you're laughing. Yeah. It's like when we were watching sitcoms in our childhoods that occasionally didn't use a laugh track. Right. Like there are episodes of The Odd Couple where they didn't use a laugh track and you're like, this is weird. Being a little kid, you know, not having those cues as to, to when to laugh. Sure. Um, another guest I just had on today was talking about doing a live stream of some of the songs from the Broadway musical he he helped write. And having to coordinate all of these different participants and, and get all that and, and sync all the audio so it was essentially live stream, but you know, they, they had to fake it a little bit just to, to keep everything together and still doing that without knowing that you're facing an audience, you know, right. hearing them. I, I just, yeah, I don't know how, well, you know, actors, it. it's the only art that requires an audience. Everything yeah. else can be done. You want the, you know, a painter wants an audience to appreciate what he's done, but he doesn't need them to do the work. Sure. Um, and same with the musician, but an actor, you know, can rehearse and whatnot, but to actually do their art, they require an audience. And uh, so this is particularly hard on them. Now, uh, anywhere you're really looking to go once we're freer to go out and do what we want? Besides, of course, you know, the, the, the gym and uh, hair salon and casino, like the, the rest of America, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> I have zero interest in going to casino. Uh, I don't get my hair cut regularly. <laughs> <laughs> and my idea of going to the gym is going outside and doing something on the farm uh, that needs to get done. Uh, it's probably not the most effective way to exercise, but it's the way that works for me. I, I don't live near anything. To, for me to go to a gym, I have to drive 25 minutes. Right. Uh, I, I have to drive but a half hour to get to the uh, Well, aspirations. Uh, we... For, uh, since 2006, uh, my dad and my two brothers and I have gone to uh, the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival, mm -hmm. and it's become a real family ritual, and it's, it's, it's really incredible. Uh, it's been an absolutely incredible experience. And uh, we were, of course, planning to go this year, and it got canceled. And this year, I was going to take my son, uh, you know, 18, ready to finish high school, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, I'm looking forward to getting back to that. I'm, I'll am i be honest with you. You know, we've had times where the whole family's been together on Zoom and whatnot. But I miss seeing my family. We're, we're both my wife and I are family people. And, uh, um, I, I, you know, uh, um, I one time told Jules Pfeiffer, I said, uh, um, I'll never be a great artist, Jules, because uh, uh, I like my family and I still get along with them. You know, I, I've always gotten along with them. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Have you been in touch with with guys like Jules, with with, you know, not your immediate circle of people? 
old friends, I mean? Um, a little bit. Um, you know, I know that everybody else is doing it. And so I don't, you know, it's, uh, I, I'm, I, I look at someone like you and you do your bike riding or your running, running, running yeah. and, uh, yeah, running. And, uh, I can't do that because I need a place to go. You know, I need to, I'm running so I can get to place B. Uh, mm-hmm. and, um, so it's very hard unless I have a reason and I'm, I'm in communication with a lot of people. Uh, but, uh, I haven't spent a tremendous amount of time going back and, and looking up old friends or, uh, like Jules, Jules is hard to call on the phone right now because yeah. his hearing is not so great. Um, so that's a little bit harder. Uh, and, but I, I have, uh, um, I have another friend who's uh, got uh, brain cancer and, you know, he's in stage four now and a bunch of us who are friends, you know, we get together on zoom to talk because it's the only thing we can do for him, you know? Uh, and, and it makes you realize that people are dying and people die all the time. And uh, it's all, everything we do is a limited time offer. And so you should make the most of it when you have it. Which takes the last question. What are you binging on Netflix? Wow. <laughs> uh, we've had a lot of time to do that. Um, so one of the first things we watched were the three seasons of The Leftovers. Um, See, the- I thought about that. My wife and I both agreed. That's probably the exact opposite of what we should be watching right now. But how did it work for you? Well, it, we were fascinated by it. Uh, yeah. It was... And it was eerie, the similarities, like why them and not me, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. Uh, so, and we watched it with uh, Jose um, as well. And it's cathartic. You know, yeah. I think that's so important. That's what great art is for. Um, you know, it, it. I think it prepares us so often in life for things that happen, the good things and the bad things. You know, any one of us who have experienced a great moment, you know, dramatic moment in music um, and, you know, where it's really, cl- you know, climactic in a way where it really it feels like a big moment. Um, when you realize when you get thrown the, the curveball in life, you can you can fall back on that. You see great movies, great works of art, great uh, and of course great books. Um, you know those are the things that I think help prepare us for all the things that happen in life. Uh, and I and it and it's I live in a farming community where nobody reads. I mean they don't read, sure. and they I mean they view me as a complete alien. You know the idea that uh, I'm a Democrat, uh, Jewish, long hair in the arts. I might as well be from Mars and (laughs) they're all good people. They're all great people, but they literally cannot understand what I do. They, they just don't, it never occurs to them. Going to a museum would be, they would just, they just don't do it. I mean, they, they, they think that you have to dress up for it or have to know something that they don't know. And I've tried to explain to them, you go there to learn. You don't go there because you know already. (laughs) Um, but it's just a, you know, it's, uh, and I know, and I can see what happens. They, you know, the tough things in life hit them and they don't have resources. They don't, they haven't been exposed to that great art. And so they're unprepared for what happens next. Not all the time, not every time, but it happens more than I uh, would believe. And as far as the books go, you mentioned, uh, you know, great books can also provide solace. Have you been, uh, Diving well, into anything? It's uh the way I keep a little saying is uh I've been rereading Saki. Uh yeah. because those short stories uh and granted he was a misogynist, he was racist, he was a closeted gay man. That's all on the table. Yet he wrote some very, very funny pieces. And they never they never cease to uh, make me smile. And so I've been finding a lot of solace in them. Uh, I've been, uh, uh, I've also been reading, uh, I just, right before this all happened, I got the last nib issue on animals. And Mm -hmm. uh, although the tendency of those is to read everything at once, I've learned that you read two or three pages and you come back to it the next day because then everything seems so much better and fresher. Um, 
so uh, and then but I've I've been reading a lot of Robert Beck. I mean, I've uh, I've read uh, about 150 of his pieces, and that's usually I read six or seven of those a night. And uh, I'm also doing I, I, most a lot of my reading is work related. Um, and luckily I do interesting work. So the reading is very interested. Uh, I'm, walk, I'm working with Michael Tisserin uh, on a uh, exhibition on race and identity in the work of George Harriman. And that has led me to, uh, I'm fascinated by the minstrel show uh, references in the work. Um, and it's led me to go back and really sort of, uh, look and listen to minstrel shows, um, Arch Archophone, uh, which is this wild record label that, you know, uh, gives you real cleaned up recordings of Edison cylinders and things like that. Um, just put out a record of minstrel show music that is, uh, I think in some ways is the most complete document that you can get of what a minstrel show sounded like. And again, <laughs> I understand the whole yes. racial. Overtones. You are not celebrating the, the negative aspects of it. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> the right. listeners will get it too. Or so I hope. No, yeah. I, I exactly. I hope too. Um, the irony is, is if people come to attack you at your farm, your neighbors would actually stand up in your defense. <laughs> I'm, just I'm sorry. That, that's awful. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's true. It's true. Uh, but, um, you know, minstrel shows were, they were real honest to God entertainment. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, I, I understand the, the, the racial problems with it, but I think it's sometimes, it, uh, I see it more as like commedia. Um, they, they took on characters, you know, the minstrel show was a very formalized uh, thing. It was, it was like, late night talk show uh, hosts. I mean, they did a lot of topical jokes. Um, they, and, and they weren't at the expense of African-Americans. It was, it was the ideas of this stupidity, but they were played. I mean, they put on blackface, like people put on white uh, uh, pancake makeup as a clown. That just was, their mm -hmm. clown was blackfaced. Um, and of course that had uh, racial overtones, but um, I'm just, uh, I find that what they do is so fascinating. It was so much more uh, as structured as it was, everybody did it a little bit differently. And it was Harriman as a young man, that would have been his entertainment. I'm looking forward to to in person exhibitions again, man. Yo, I, man. <laughs> you know, I'm looking oh. forward to coming down. I've even thought about the if I was if I knew I was clean, I knew David was. I, I could drive down to Bucks County. I, I could right. go to the Soloway thing, but but yeah, it's that that weird temptation of eh, now nah, we're just asking for trouble. So well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I I every year I do my garden a little bit differently, and this year I made a socially distant garden where I can sit with people and be more than six feet apart. Yeah. And uh, garden's pretty uh, almost done, and. Uh, so I work with a, a wonderful person, uh, Catherine Marshall, who I do a pod show with, uh, podcast with, um, called the Hirschfeld Century, and and uh, we work. We've been working together for about six years in the Hirschfeld Foundation, and uh, she, you know, she's in a uh, she lives about an hour away, and she's in a one bedroom apartment with her husband, and they're both working, and they have two dogs, and. You know, they get a little stir crazy. So tonight I said, why don't they come to our place? We will order out. So we'll have the same food, um, but, you know, we'll just go pick it up. And we'll sit in the garden and be close, but not right on top of each other. And just so they can get a change of pace. And, in, and like I said, it's nice to see people uh, yeah. in person. <laughs> Yeah, that's been my my th the only conversation I've had in person besides with my wife and my dog who, you know, doesn't talk back yes. too much right. was my neighbor's grandkid when she and her boyfriend were sneaking around behind the house because the the owner had, had moved away a couple of weeks before. I was talking to her about 10 feet away because I had to go find out who was behind the house. And I realized when I was walking back home, I'm like, that's the first in-person conversation I've oh, yeah. had in weeks and weeks and the last one I've had in weeks and weeks. So, 
Yeah. Well, Captain I'll comes in once a week and, and, yeah. and uh, we talk across the yard, you know, yeah. but that's it. Uh, um, other than that, no, I haven't, I, I haven't seen anybody either. So it's, I'll, um, I'll come down, I'll come down with a bullhorn. So, so I can, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to play croquet tonight. Cause I thought that was also something we could do together. We wouldn't have to be right on top of each other. Yeah. That sounds good. And, you know, if it does turn out to be some weird transmissibility thing, you'll have played for croquet in the name of, of epidemiology. Yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> Everything will be safe. It'll be wonderful. Well, we, know, we just decided we wanted to try. You know, we, we yeah. uh, um, but we're all petrified of getting it. So uh, I'm not worried that something will go wrong or we'll get too close to each other because, I mean, Catherine yeah. already had three things of Clorox wipes in the office long before this ever started. She's been a clean freak forever. So, um, cool. I wish you luck and I hope you, uh, you beat her like a drum. That's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm no good at croquet. <laughs> well, we'll see. Maybe that'll turn out to be your superpower now in the, uh, the <laughs> <Yeah>. pandemic era. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, man. Have a great day. Oh, my pleasure. Too. Thank you. And that was David Leopold. You can follow him on Twitter at Peanot, which is P-K-N-O-T. Uh, the Ben Soloway uh, studio is at Soloway.com, which is S-O-L-O-W-E-Y.com. And the Al Hirschfeld Foundation and its online exhibitions, like the uh, Socially Distant Theater, is at AlHirschfeldFoundation.org. There'll be links to all of that in the show and episode notes for this one. And we should be back tomorrow with another COVID check-in. Uh, I've got one scheduled for today. Um, if that comes through, we're all set. If not, you'll have to wait until Friday. Um, in the meantime, if you want to send me a little update to read on the air or have something you want to share with our listeners, let me know and we'll set something up. I'm at groth18, G-R-O-T-H-1-8, at gmail.com. You can find my contact info at our websites, vmspod.com and chimeraobscura.com slash vm. And you can find a link to the COVID-19 sessions at both sites with all of these daily episodes. And you can also just subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show via iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcatcher. The RSS feed is available at our site, and that way you'll get every episode. And you can also go back and look through the archives of... Uh, about 370 in-person shows. Now, in the before time, I recorded it in person all the time, and now I have to do it remotely because of pandemic. Um, to do that, I'm using Zencaster.com, which is Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R, so no final E in Zencaster. There's a free hobby level, but I use the pro level that's 20 bucks a month, gives you a few more perks, better audio quality file at the end. Um, but as far as costs for this stuff goes, uh, I am perfectly fine. I'm, I'm, my job is paying me well. I still have Patreon supporters. And just that more than covers the um, Zencaster and Libsyn, which is the service I use to host the podcast. So it's really just about my time because um, I'm not spending money anymore on parking and tolls and subway trips and coffee and and everything else that was making my wife a podcast widow on weekends. So uh, what I'm saying is, if you can spare anything, don't give it to me. Um, give it to the artists, writers, other creative people, and people in need. Go find their Patreons, GoFundMes, Kickstarters, Indiegogos, tip jars, whatever, uh, and help. And if you don't like to help individuals and would rather help a, a cause or a foundation, um, there are plenty of good charities out there, including your local food bank. Um, so what I'm saying is, if you're in a position to help someone right now, do that. We all need help in our various ways. As far as my help goes, drop me an email sometime if you're enjoying these conversations and just uh, just let me know that. Or uh, if you have ideas for other people I should be recording with, or even if you want to say something critical about what I'm doing, uh, you know, I appreciate the attention. As an old girlfriend once posted a quote on my door back in college, uh, it's better to be wanted for murder than not to be wanted at all. We're still friends, which is the amazing thing. Anyway, I'm Gil Roth. It is Wednesday, May 20th, 2020. This was a bonus episode of my Virtual Memory Show podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Keep the conversation going, stay safe, and wash your damn hands.